Good morning. Today we have a last lecture before Christmas, so we have two more lectures to go. One will be after Christmas, the New Year. Uh, today we'll be talking about liquid level sensors. We, you will see that the uh, liquid level has many things in common with pressure sensors, for example, and uh, also with position sensors. So many types of sensors that you will see today should be familiar to you already. Uh, when we are looking at liquid level, uh, we can distinguish between two types of sensors. Uh, one is uh, for continuous measurement and one is for point level detection. Uh, the continuous sensor gives you continuous information about the distance between the sensor and between the liquid level. So uh, the output is uh, either a voltage or a current signal if it's an analog signal, or if it can be some digital bus. In both cases, the uh, information that you receive is the distance. So it's some number saying you how far it is. So this will be quite related to position sensors. Uh, this is a good information if you know that you have um, like 1.5 meter of liquid in your tank, for example, but uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not necessary in all applications. So in some applications you just need to know if the tank is empty or if the tank is full. So in these applications uh, it's uh, less expensive to use uh, point level sensors. So point level sensors uh, they give you just the information the liquid is above this level or it's below this level and that's all. So the output is uh, a digital signal uh, the output is a one or a zero saying liquid is there, liquid is not there. Of course, you can install more, more uh, point level detectors in the, in the tank and you can detect the tank is empty, the tank is full if you, if you need it. Uh, some sensors, they allow you also to give you uh, some properties of the liquid that is in the tank, such as the density or um, to measure interface. Interface means that uh, you have a mixture of uh, two different liquids or you have um, a mixture of, uh, of the liquid and the foam on top of it. So in some applications you uh, are interested also into measuring this to know how much liquid is there, how much foam is there. So uh, you will see also uh, that some sensors are able to measure the interface or density. For liquid level, there are many principles that we may use. Uh, they are, in s many cases, the same for point level and for continuous reading. So here you see a selection of principles for point level detection, and this is for continuous measurements. And uh, the ones highlighted in yellow will be the ones we will cover in this lecture. So we will not cover all of them. It would require like three or four lectures, but we will just make a selection. And uh, here you have liquids and you here you have solids. So uh, this will be related also to measuring how much solid you have in a silo. So it, it, may be, it may be rocks, it may be sand, it may be uh, some chemical materials that you need for some chemical process. Uh, you see that here in all categories almost, uh, we have a capacitive sensor, so we will see that we can again use capacity for to do it all this. Uh, you will see that we will again use ultrasonic, we'll use also radar, and uh, you see that it works as a continuous sensor for both liquids and solids. And then for liquids we will see the hydrostatic sensor. Uh, here, just to give you an idea what is all possible, um, we can measure liquid level in many, many ways. Uh, so imagine that you have a tank and your goal is to measure the liquid level in the tank, um, simply because you may do some chemical process and you, may you need to prepare the chemicals in a specified amount and then you empty that in some other tank and you mix it, for example. 
uh, or you store this liquid or this solid in a silo and uh, you need to know how much do you have in the tank because you want to sell it for example so uh, the, the ones here on uh, the right side are sensors that are good for uh, point level detection so uh, for example the vibrating fork we will cover it today as well will give you information if the liquid level is above or if it's below that's all it will not read how much liquid there is above uh, the ones on the top here are sensors that are for continuous reading and uh, know that they are mostly placed on top of the silo so that they are not in direct contact with the liquid but uh, they have some active sensing element that is inside the tank such as the ultrasonic or radar that and they measure the distance between the top of the silo where the sensor is installed to uh, the liquid level itself uh, this works in many applications we will see that all sensors have limitations and it may not work correctly with foam for example or if you have a mixture of uh, liquid and uh, and some other liquid when you have interface uh, the, the other sensors here, as such as this float switch or this magnetic level gauge, are um, mostly used uh, for information. They, they have some flow that is showing you what is the liquid level in the tank. Uh, the one that you see here uh, may work in the whole range, simply because the liquid level in the tank and in this tube is connected so there is a flow that is moving up and down and uh, you uh, measure the position of the float or you just simply see that on the scale uh, the float switch that you see here is uh, also a point level device so uh, there is a float and uh, as soon as the liquid level reaches this opening the float starts to move up and uh, it will detect that the liquid level is at some given position and it will, for example, disconnect the pump that is pumping the liquid into the tank so that you do not overfill that. Um, so why can liquid level measurement be difficult? Um, it doesn't have to be difficult. If uh, you have a steady liquid in a tank and uh, you just want to get this liquid level. Uh, but as soon as you start mixing, which you may require for the chemical process, for example, or that the liquid does not harden, then where is the liquid level? So here you see when I start mixing in the same tank, this vortex will form and uh, then where is the liquid level? So you are trying to estimate where the liquid level would be if uh, the liquid st will stand still. So uh, for many reasons uh, in the processing environment it may be difficult to get the correct reading of liquid level because here there is no problem at all almost any sensor will work uh, if you install a sensor here then if for example you use ultrasound you may have problems with the shaft of the of the mixer uh, if you use some other device that will measure in one point, then what point should you choose? Do, do you choose this point, then you measure this liquid level and you have measurement that uh, is not true. If you uh, measure at this point, then uh, you have uh, another reading, but uh, again it's not true because the liquid level it will be above this in this case. Uh, so uh, this is not a problem at all if you have no mixtures if you have no bubbles and so on but let's imagine that we uh, add bubbles then some sensors will detect that as a false reading and will not work correctly we'll see that um, today uh, then you may add foam on top of it uh, you may add vapors above that uh, you may add sediments, which will prevent uh, some sensors that you install from the bottom to work correctly. Um, then you may add high temperatures, high pressures. You may add uh, you may add acids so that they will be aggressive to the sensor itself. Uh, you may add radiation, 
and uh, you may add maintenance costs because the application uh, will probably have to work for next 50 years and uh, then you may end up with the problem that uh, with our technology we cannot measure that at all. Uh, so this is for liquids. For solids uh, it's uh, quite similar. Uh, you may have problems in uh, reading the correct liquid level or solid level in this case uh, because if you have a silo like this uh, then you pour the material into the silo uh, and it may end like that so where do you place the sensor should I read this liquid level or this liquid level or any other level that I find uh, then it's sometimes hard to uh, prevent some holes, some openings that will be formed in the solid. So then, you again, you do not measure correctly uh, the amount of material that you have because you measure the li liquid level times the cross-section of, of the tank and it's not correct because you d don't have the tank filled completely. So here, for example, you, you may add weights and you may weight the silo if you are interested into uh, the, the weight, for example. Uh, then you may have multiple peaks, so some sensors, they uh, detect the closest spot from the sensor and if you have multiple peaks, then which one should you choose? Sh should you choose this one or, or this one or any other one? So this is uh, for solids and uh, also in uh, many cases you may have mixtures of uh, different materials. So, uh, for example, uh, you may have uh, a liquid here, uh, let's say this will be water, and uh, then you may have uh, oil on top of it, which will not mix together, and uh, on top you may have foam, and you may be interested into knowing the, the ratio. So, you don't want to read the top of this level but you want to read the amount of water that you have there. So uh, some sensors will also be good for this application. So uh, what options do we have? Uh, there is always a relation between uh, the cost of the sensor and uh, between uh, what it can do and but but what you can afford for the application. Of course, if you buy a really expensive sensor, uh, then it may be good for many things that you have just seen, but you cannot afford it for the application, for example. So this is an overview that uh, divides the sensor principles uh, based on price. And but here you ha see the criteria is how hard it is to measure something. So, for example, if you measure water that is in the tank, you may use all sensors that are present here in the table. It will be very easy. You don't have bubbles, you don't have mixtures. But even if you have it, it's quite easy. Uh, but here, for example, imagine that you have uh, some really hot or cryogenic liquids. Uh, you have some vessels with internal structures that support the pressure and this internal structure will prevent radio signal and ultrasound to uh, be distributed properly, so you cannot use those principles. Uh, you can imagine that if this will be radiation um, sensor, then it may work. Um, it depends also on uh, the maintenance cost, how long should the sensor be working in the application. So. It's it's a nice overview. It's always a trade-off between all those things. So, uh, why is it necessary to measure precisely liquid level? Um, imagine that you will be selling some product or making some product, and that the product will require a precise recipe. So you have some tanks with the with the, the initial materials. Uh, and you need to mix them together and you have the final product. So uh, m in many cases the product, the, the, the initial material is stored in some large silos. So here is an example, uh, 20 meter diameter, it's nothing unusual for liquid level. Uh, for example, petrochemical products are stored in uh, much larger tanks. And uh, imagine that you have an error of measurement just by 10 millimeters, so one centimeter. 
but in this large cross-section it will give you an error of three cube meters which may prevent you to mix correctly the uh, materials to, to achieve what you want. So uh, the sensors that you need for liquid level needs to be accurate um, let's say within one or two millimeters and uh, they need to have a range of um, let's say 10 to 20 meters distance. So um, that's why it's so hard. Uh, we will start with uh, some examples for continuous measurements. So all those sensors uh, now will give us a continuous reading. So they will give us a signal, voltage, current, uh, data about the distance. Uh, let's start with the hydrostatic liquid level meter. Uh, this is uh, basically a pressure sensor and you measure the hydrostatic pressure. So imagine that you have a tank like this and you want to measure the liquid level. Uh, you can place a pressure sensor at the bottom of the liquid and uh, you can measure this hydrostatic pressure. Uh, this works quite well unless you have some sediments at the bottom which will block the sensor. So this is an example uh, of uh, a sensor that you should not use for applications with sediments. Uh, the sensor placed here and sho shown here is um, a pressure sensor. In my picture, uh, for no reason at all, it is um, a well-type manometer, but it can be any other type of sensor that we have discussed for pressure. So it can be a diaphragm sensor, for example, which is most common today. So then you just read the hydrostatic pressure at the bottom and you calculate uh, the liquid level. Uh, of course, it, you measure pressure, so you need to know the density if you want to calculate the liquid level, uh, and uh, therefore you need to know the temperature. So if the temperature is not evenly distributed in the tank, or uh, if it is changing, then you may have trouble with that. Uh, but if, if not, it's without any problem. Uh, of course, you need to compensate also for the distance uh, between the bottom of the tank and the sensor itself. So uh, you may subtract this liquid level, uh, di this distance, uh, because if it's too long, it may corrupt the, the reading. So this works in this way in open tanks. Uh, it can be also used uh, in a hydros in um, closed tanks, in pressurized tanks. So this is an example. Uh, then you have one hole at the bottom where you connect one pressure uh, and then here you have a second above the tank and you measure pressure difference. So uh, you should use sensors uh, for pressure difference. Again, it could be the diaphragm-based sensors. They can measure both the pressure and the pressure difference. I have some sensor like this here with me. So this is a hydrostatic pressure sensor. You see it's on a, on a long cable. So from top of the tank, you submerge this at the bottom of the tank. And if you look from the bottom here, uh, there is the diaphragm, the ceramic diaphragm that we have seen uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, it reads pressure at the bottom and sends this as a, a current or a voltage signal. Now, uh, let's take a look on, uh, on a video that will explain us uh, the eventual problems that we may have with this kind of sensor, and we'll also see some application examples. Thank you. 
measurement by absolute or gauge pressures, hydrostatic pressure, as well as differential pressure. The first scientific origins of pressure measurement were documented in the middle of the 17th century. Galileo Galilei made tests of the pumps to overcome the differences in altitude for irrigation purposes. Ivercali Stefaricelli conducted research with mercury columns and discovered the state of Pascal conducted these experiments and continued the research and proved the German meaning weight of air. Pascal called this force pressure, and to pay homage to him, the SI unit for pressure was named after him. Pressure is the result of a force acting on an area. Pressure instruments may be used to detect absolute and gauge pressure. ceramic cell, an electrically conducted material is applied to a ceramic substrate, thus forming a capacitor. As pressure is applied, a diaphragm deforms and causes a change in capacitance. The absolute pressure cell is a closed system measured against the vacuum. In an atmospheric environment, air pressure is indicated. In a gauge pressure cell, an opening in the substrate permits pressure compensation between the atmospheric environment and the inside of the cell. The cell measures values which are relative to the ambient pressure. In the atmospheric environment, the air pressure is not indicated. In hydrostatic pressure measurement, the liquid in the tank acts on the process diaphragm of the sensor. Gravity causes the pressure to increase as the liquid column, that is the filling level of the tank, rises. Okay, so now let's take a look on uh, the properties of this sensor. So what's inside? We've seen that there is always some um, element that is being deformed if it's a diaphragm. So here we have some examples. So this is the port for connecting the pressure. The diaphragm is inside and you measure the deformation either with a strain gauge or with some other position sensor. Uh, you see here we have uh, the diaphragm which is which is in this place and this rod is uh, the 
core of a transformer. So this is an LVDT position sensor. So when I increase the pressure, this core is moving up and uh, it's being de detected by a position sensor. So uh, you can either evaluate the signal directly or you can have a sensor for position, but this gives you pressure. Uh, those are some examples of the hydrostatic liquid level sensors. Um, the ones you see here are the ones that you have the chance to see here. So you submerge this on the cable into the tank uh, and you measure the hydrostatic pressure at the bottom with this sensor. Uh, another examples, so the same principle you see here, uh, this is the hole where the material enters into the sensor. Uh, it can also look like this if uh, you have some larger particles, so uh, you, can, you may prevent them from going into the sensor. Uh, so what can you expect? Uh, the hydrostatic pressure sensor is good for relatively high temperatures, so let's say roughly up to 400 centigrades, and uh, also large pressures, so those are data from uh, some un industrial sensors. Uh, the temperature cannot be higher simply because all the sensor is submerged in the liquid and uh, it would destroy the sensor. Uh, also the pressures. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the hydrostatic sensor is uh, not affected by foam that you have on top of the liquid level. So uh, this would be a good sensor if, uh, for example, you measure um, a beer during production, you have foam on top and, uh, for example, ultrasonic sensor will not be good for this, but uh, it will be a good idea to use hydrostatic pressure if it's not entirely on the bottom where you may have sediments again. So, uh, no, f no foam, that's not, not a problem, uh, but sediment may be a problem if the sensor is right on the bottom, it may block the sensor entirely. Okay, second sensor uh, is uh, the pneumatic liquid level meter, also called a bubbler. Um, it's a very simple device and uh, this, on the other hand, will be very good for sediments because uh, the principle how it works will eliminate sediments around the sensor itself. Uh, there is a video linked in, in this application, in this presentation, you may look on the video at home. It's quite experiment yourself. If you, if you take a glass and a straw, then if you blow into the straw, then uh, if you s continue submerging the straw, you need to blow harder. So, and this is the principle of the bubbler. So uh, you are overcoming the hydrostatic pressure in a tube that is submerged in a tank. So we have a tank and you have a tube that is inside the tank. Uh, you need some compressed air and you're blowing the air into the, bu into the tube. And if uh, the pressure that you provide is larger than the hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the tube, then you will have bubbles. And that, that's it. So uh, you are trying to create such a pressure that you are creating bubbles and uh, that you have a defined flow rate of the air. So what you need is a tube, you need a source of compressed gas, but many technologies in industrial um, field, they have the sor source of compressed gas, air. Uh, you need a pressure sensor and you need a flow sensor or f a flow regulator. So you're providing the compressed gas with some flow and uh, if the gas is flowing then you have bubbles. Uh, the ratio between the, the del differential pressure, so the pressure difference here, is proportional to flow. So uh, even if you have bubbles then there will be a, dif a dependence between the flow rate uh, between the liquid level. So uh, if you are increasing the flow rate, uh, then the, the, um, the pressure that you measure will 
basically uh, look like this. So uh, this is the pressure that you add uh, to have some bubbles. So uh, if you set some constant flow rate, then you will have a constant pressure. And uh, the pressure that you measure with the pressure sensor will be then proportional to the liquid level. So uh, you can either uh, manually change the flow or you can have a flow regulator. But if you keep the flow constant, then the signal from the pressure sensor which you have here will be, with re will be related to the liquid level. So that's what you see what you see here. So this is the pressure that is coming from the liquid level. So this is uh, H1 times density of the liquid times gravitational acceleration. And then this delta P2 is the pressure difference that is uh, proportional to flow. So if I uh, have bubbles, if I know what is my flow rate, and I read the pressure sensor data, I can e quite easily uh, read the liquid level. Uh, this sensor has a very big advantage. The only uh, part of the sensor that is in contact with the liquid itself is the tube. So uh, the pressure sensor, the flow sensor or the flow regulator uh, can be completely outside of the tank. Uh, they are not in contact with the liquid. So you can measure also aggressive liquids like acids, for example. You can make the tube from stainless steel or from ceramics. And uh, it's the only device that is in contact with the liquid. So the bubbler uh, is used for those aggressive liquids. Uh, it also has one big advantage. Uh, it does not need um, large maintenance because uh, if you have bubbles, if the gas is flowing, the sensor works. So uh, if you do not stop the compressed air, uh, the liquid cannot enter into the tube, cannot block it, and it will work at all times. So the bubbler is uh, very reliable. It's uh, a device used for uh, aggressive liquids, for liquids where you have uh, mixtures of, uh, of uh, solid material and liquid ma liquids, uh, so it cannot be blocked at all. Uh, let me see if I have some... Well, the video is quite long, eight minutes, we'll not watch it, only if we have time at the end. Uh, you can have uh, a look on the sensor uh, in the labs. It's in lab 409. Uh, it's like quite large, so I, I couldn't bring it. Uh, so it's very reliable and uh, good for aggressive materials. Uh, here you see how it looks like. So uh, this is uh, uh, the pressure regulator. So here you set the, the pressure that you, that you want. Uh, and uh, here, this is the, the pressure sensor, and then the tube here uh, connects the pressure sensor to the pipe system, and then from here, it will go through into the pipe and uh, will control, uh, will give you the, the reading. Uh, on the other hand, if you look on, on this picture, it needs some specific materials uh, in the tank. So it's not good for all applications, again. Uh, and the process itself needs to allow you to add some air into the, into the liquid. So uh, this would not be a good example for sensor for beer, again, because here, if you would blow beer, the custom air into the beer, the customer would not like it very much. So uh, it's good for industrial applications, but not for all of them, again. Okay, uh, third sensor, um, and I would say that uh, this is a very common sensor, uh, is a capacitive sensor. And uh, you may recognize those pictures from the position sensors, because it is exactly a position sensor. Uh, so here we are using uh, the changes of capacity that are caused by the changes of material that we have in the capacitor. So the capacitor 
uh, typically the one electrode is the tank itself if it is conductive the second electrode is some uh, wire uh, rope uh, chain um, rod that you have in the tank it needs to be conductive as well and uh, when you change the liquid level you're basically changing the dielectric material between uh, the electrodes so uh, we know that the capacity of a capacitor depends on the cross-section of the electrodes which is constant in this case it depends on the distance between the electrodes that's constant again in this case but here uh, we have relative permittivity which is a function of material so if I'm increasing the liquid level here uh, I'm ch changing the capacity because I'm changing the ratio between the capacitor formed with this material and between the capacitor formed with this material. So this is typically, let's say, water or and this is air. Uh, we have a third component in the equation, C0 here, and uh, this is a constant term that describes the capacity uh, of the connectors of the wire and of the entire assembly. So uh, when I'm increasing the liquid level, C1 is increasing, C2 is decreasing, and C0 remains constant. So at the end, uh, we, we will have a direct relation between the capacity and between the liquid level here. Uh, this example on the left side is uh, the arrangement for non-conductive liquids. So the capacitor has one electrode in the middle and this electrode does not need to be insulated. So I'm measuring the capacity between this electrode and between the tank itself, which is cylindrical in most cases. And the capacitor and the material is this liquid. Uh, if the liquid is conductive, then you need to insulate at least one electrode and it's easier to insulate just the rod, rod in the middle. So here you see there is insulation and uh, since this liquid is now conductive, it acts as the electrode itself. So I, I'm, uh, I have a material with some permittivity, I'm increasing the liquid level and I'm increasing the area of the electrodes. So again, C1 is increasing with increasing liquid level, C2 is decreasing and C0 remains constant. In both cases, uh, there is a, a linear dependence between the capacity and between the liquid level. So it has a nice steady state characteristic. Uh, in case of uh, a cylindrical capacitor, uh, the formula for capacitor is more complicated than the usual one. Uh, here, just to, to give you an idea how to calculate that, uh, I just want to show you the, the final result here, which uh, is saying us also that the capacity depends on the material, it depends on the cross-section and on the distance. So here uh, you see I have height, so this is the cr this defines the cross section uh, of the of the tank. Uh, this is the distance, uh, the larger diameter and the electro diameter. So this is the distance between the electrodes and permittivity. That's the material itself. So this sensor uh, will have a nice linear steady state response. Basically, it will be some constant plus some constant times the liquid level height. So it will be uh, a linear dependence that we like a lot. Uh, in some cases, uh, you may create this as uh, two planar electrodes, so two boards uh, that you submerged into the liquid like this, and uh, then you just calculate the capacity. Uh, it works in exactly the same way here, uh, you are changing the liquid level and you are reading the capacity between the electrodes. Uh, if uh, the liquid is conductive, of course, you need to insulate the electrodes again. Uh, it works only uh, when you have uh, a large difference between the uh, dielectric uh, properties here, between the permittivity of the material 
that you measure and between the material above. So, for example, it would work quite well for water, uh, which has a uh, permittivity of roughly 80 for, for uh, uh, some temperatures. And uh, here air has permittivity of 1. So there is a large change when I change the liquid level. It will not work properly when the two permittivities are close. So, for example, if this would be a material with 1.5 and this would be air with 1, then the capacity will change, but the ch change will be very small. So this is not a good way to use uh, a capacitive sensor. Uh, let's take a look on a video where we'll see uh, the installation and eventual problems. Capacitive level measurement offers a wide variety of possibilities for level monitoring in liquids and bulk solids. The space between two unevenly charged objects is called an electric field. In this space, one electric charge exerts a force on another charge. The strength and direction of the electric field is shown by lines of flux. sticks to the probe, this is recognized as a change in capacity in relation to air, comparable to a product. In this case, the lines of flux run directly through the buildup to the tank wall. Even if the product does not cover the probe, it reports covering erroneously. Endress and Hauser has developed a capacitive probe with active buildup compensation. The probe has an additional protective electrode with the same potential as the measuring probe. Which not only generates one electric field, but two identical fields. The shielding effect of the active buildup compensation prevents a direct current flow along the probe electrode to the tank wall. Therefore, the current of the probe does not flow in the area of the buildup, but only in the area of the actual cover. This principle enables the probe to measure reliably, even in spite of strong conductive buildup. Okay. Precise. Good. So let's take a look on the properties with this sensor. So here is how it looks like. So this is a capacitive sensor for measuring liquid level in a fuel tank. And uh, the, the central electrode is this one, it goes all the way inside. And those small holes allow you the, the entry of the product. And then uh, the capacity between this electrode and the external electrode is measured. Uh, the similar thing here, uh, so this is the electrode itself. This is the electronics that evaluates the changes of uh, capacity. It looks like this. So. Um, here you see the electrode, either one electrode, and then you measure against the wall of the tank, as we have seen on the video, or you have two electrodes and you measure the changes between the electrodes itself. Uh, so what can you expect? Uh, since uh, the only part of the sensor in contact 
is the electro itself then uh, it is good also for aggressive media or heavy build-up applications as we have seen on the video uh, you can make the electrode from stainless steel and that will not corrode in an, in an acid for example um, you can use one electrode only and the second electrode is the silo itself so uh, this works uh, for higher temperatures and relatively higher pressures so for this sensor for example you see 400 centigrade and 100 bar pressure so uh, roughly the same uh, numbers uh, like uh, we had for the for the first sensor the, the hydrostatic pressure sensor uh, the capacitive sensor uh, can be also combined with other principles for example with radar as we will see a little bit later so uh, it's good for applications where you have uh, mixtures uh, where, where you have uh, an interface layer and uh, it will detect reliably the interface as well I have a video prepared at, at the end okay and uh, next is ultrasonic so uh, this works in uh, exactly the same way like an ultrasonic distance sensor uh, so you place the sensor above the tank it is a transmitter and a receiver uh, you transmit an ultrasonic pulse and this pulse gets reflected on the interface and you measure how long did it take before I received the reflection so uh, the time is proportional to the distance between the sensor and between the liquid level uh, the larger the distance the longer the time and uh, there is an indirect relation between the, the liquid level height uh, this sensor uh, may have problems with foams that you have on top of the liquid so if there is foam here and it will absorb the ultrasonic signal so it's not good for those applications uh, on the other hand it will be good for larger pressures a little bit larger temperatures uh, let's take a look on the video how this works I think it's a bit combined also with uh, with the radar sensor that we will see in a few minutes
central membrane and the medium surface. Microwaves or radar waves, however, are electromagnetic waves. Radar impulses are generated electromagnetically and reflected on the medium surface by the change of the dielectric constant. The high frequency radar pulses can be led along a rod through the medium or they can be emitted free in a tank. The time of flight measurement demonstrated here by the example of free emitted radar pulses works both in liquids and solids. The emitted pulses are reflected from the medium surface and detected by the instrument. The time of flight of the pulse determines the distance between the transmitter and the surface using the known propagation of speed. In the case of radar pulses, it is the speed of light. Taking the height of the tank into consideration, the level can easily be calculated. Endress and Hauser time of flight instruments are measuring the level even in high pressures and temperatures applications. In different vapor or on aggressive media with turbulent liquid surfaces or when foam at the liquid surface. We have the right solution for any application. Endress and Hauser. Okay, so we've seen the radar sensor as well. Uh, here are some examples of the ultrasonic liquid level meters. Um, so this is the transmitter and receiver, so the piezoelectric generator and receiver. Uh, I have some examples here. So this is it. Ultrasound is here. This is in a tank like this from top and it measures the distance. The same here but this hangs on a cable and you measure the distance from this to the liquid level. And the output is uh, a current or a voltage signal. Um, so uh, this ultrasonic sensor uh, allows you to measure uh, in applications where you have um, some, some uh, liquid level without a foam uh, and uh, it's not affected by uh, changes of properties such as uh, dielectric constant of the material uh, or density or moisture. Uh, dielectric constant is uh, quite important for radar sensors because if uh, you have a, um, a small dielectric constant then you will not have the reflection. Um, here uh, you don't have the problem with the per permittivity so like for the capacitive sensor uh, if the permittivity is quite close uh, to the air, it's not possible to measure with capacitive sensors. It's the case, for example, of plastic materials uh, like polypropylene. It typically has a permittivity of roughly 1.5, so it's very close to, to air. And you cannot measure with capacitive sensor, but you can do it with ultrasound. Uh, temperatures are 150 centigrades for the ultrasound, a little bit higher for the radar, and uh, also for the radar it's, it's higher temperatures and higher pressures. Uh, because here for the ultrasound sensor, the whole assembly needs to be in the tank and just temperatures and pressures can be lower. If this is a radar sensor, then there you have just the antenna inside, which can be made from stainless steel and it can be sealed. So. Um, you will see that the radar sensor will have higher temperatures and higher pressures. Um, you've seen the principle on the video, so I don't need to repeat it. Uh, but there are two principles um, hidden in, th in the radar sensor. Uh, one is the time of flight, as we have seen on the video. So, so you measure the time it takes for receiving the reflection. Uh, the problem in this I case is that the time is very, very short because uh, ultrasound travels with the speed of sound, which is roughly 300 meters per second, but uh, radio waves travel with the speed of light, uh, which is th roughly 300 meters per microsecond. So uh, you need to be able to measure very accurately some uh, time, uh, time difference. Uh, so this is used uh, basically for larger distances where this time uh, is uh, it's possible to m to measure it? Um, some radar liquid level meters use also the frequency modulated continuous wave 
princ principle that we have covered for the um, position sensors. So uh, here you have a transmitter, you transmit a radio wave that is not a pulse but it's continuous and you change the frequency of this radio wave. This radio wave gets reflected from the object and you receive it and you are comparing the frequency that you trans that you receive now with the frequency that you transmit and uh, the distance between the antenna and between the object is a relation uh, is related to the frequency difference uh, so you do not need to measure the time difference but you measure the frequency difference which is relatively easy to do you multiply the two signals together in, in a mixer and then you're looking for the phase difference so this is easier to do uh, compared to the short time of flight that you need that you would need to measure so this is used for uh, laser distance meters radar distance meters as well uh, as for liquid level meters this is how it looks like we have seen that on the video so this is the antenna uh, and uh, the antenna is the only object that is in contact with the with the, the liquid or with the, with the tank so it can be made from stainless steel it will not corrode and then it can be sealed with an armature and the whole electronic circuit is outside and it can work for higher temperatures as well uh, the second option I'm not sure if I have it here no I don't have it here but we have seen that on the video the second option is that the antenna will not be a cone like this but it will be a rod this is called a waveguide and uh, you can combine this radar uh, with, with the rod, with the waveguide, with a capacitive sensor. I have an example uh, at, at the end. So you can combine it and you can measure liquid level and interface at the same time. But the sensors that use this combination are uh, quite expensive. Uh, so what can you expect? Uh, the radar sensors are not affected by vapors and dust. Uh, the frequencies that are used are high frequency signals, so 6 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz, 24 gigahertz. And uh, since the only object that is in contact with the tank itself is the antenna, it can work for high temperatures and high pressures. So uh, roughly 450 centigrades and pressures up to uh, 160 bars. Uh, that's the, the data from, from this sensor. Other sensors may have it in a little bit different way, but that's roughly what you can expect. Any questions so far? Okay, no questions. So now we'll just cover very briefly uh, the level measurements. So uh, if you need uh, the continuous reading, you need to use the previous sensors, which may be very expensive. Uh, but in many cases you just need to detect the level as a point in the tank. So those sensors will be uh, much less expensive than the continuous sensors. And you may install two or three and it may be sufficient for the, your application. Uh, the first principle based on conductivity uh, is uh, a continuous sensor but it's also a point level sensor. So this combines both uh, in the same way and it depends on how you evaluate the, the changes and how you, how you connect that, how you arrange the sensor in the application. So if you arrange two electrodes like this in the tank, uh, it will work as a continuous sensor. Uh, if you are increasing the liquid level in the tank, uh, you are increasing the current that is flowing through the electrodes so this works only for conductive materials so for conductive liquids if your liquid is not conductive it will not work at all um, so you have a current source and uh, you push current through this uh, arrangement through those electrodes and when i uh, connect the two electrodes together with the conductive liquids i'm decreasing resistance i'm increasing conductivity and i'm increasing current so it can work as a continuous sensor. It can work also as a limit switch if you arrange it in, in this way. So this electrode now uh, is connected with the other one 
uh, through the conductive liquid so there is current flowing here and I know that the liquid level is above this level where the sensor is installed above the lower limit and uh, there is no current flowing through this electrode here and here since it's not connected together with the conductive liquid so uh, this is how it can be done with the uh, with the capacitor with, with the conductivity liquid level meter so it works in both ways uh, I have here an example over here uh, this is a conductive conductivity based uh, based sensor so the conductivity probe is he built here inside uh, the probe here is uh, for temperature reading and then again uh, it's a just a point level sensor So the disadvantage of this is that it requires a conductive liquid. So if you don't have a conductive liquid, you can't use this principle. Uh, it can work for temperatures uh, roughly to 150 centigrades and pressures up to 25 bars. Here you see the arrangement with three electrodes. So you may have two electrodes, you may have three electrodes, you may have more electrodes uh, as well based on, on what you need looks like this so um, this is basically what what we have here in in uh, as an example so a pipe with the two hidden electrodes and you measure the capacity or uh, sorry conductivity or you may have electrodes like this externally and you measure uh, this as a point level sensor or it may be used as a continuous reading as well okay and the last sensor uh, will be only for point level detection so this is not a continuous sensor uh, it's called a vibrating fork and uh, it's used for liquids and for solids as well so how does it work let's imagine I have um, a fork like this and I make it vibrate uh, I will excite that with a piezoelectric exciter so this will vibrate with some resonance frequency and I will detect uh, the vibrations with a piezo detector I can measure uh, the frequency, I can measure the amplitude uh, when the fork is submerged in a liquid it will have a different resonance frequency than if it's not, if it's freely in the air and I can detect those changes in resonance frequency and I can say it's the tank is above this sensor above this liquid level but it's definitely below this liquid level and I cannot I can't say anything in between so I don't know if the liquid level is here if it's here or if it's there I just know it's not empty but I know it's not full uh, let's take a look on the video again we'll see the device in action for solids and for liquids as well.
discs of two discs, a piezo and a ceramic disc, which are connected to each other. At the same voltage, the piezos are compressed and the ceramic disc is bent. At different voltages, the piezos expand again. This causes the oscillations of the coil. The stack drive, however, stacks and fixes several piezo discs with changing polarization on top of each other. The application of a respective alternating voltage also causes the piezos to oscillate. As the piezos expand, the membrane is bent to the outside. The ends of the tuning fork, which is attached to the membrane, are pushed apart. As the piezo contracts again, the membrane is bent to the inside. the frequency. This frequency change is analyzed and converted into a switching signal. In solids measurement, only the piezoelectric stack drive is used. As the bulk solids cover the fork, the oscillation is down. This changes the amplitude of the oscillation. The change is analyzed and converted into a switching signal. The vibronic measuring principle of Anderson Alton enables a point-level detection unaffected by the physical properties of the medium. For example, conductivity, dielectric constant, density changes, pressure or temperature, turbulences, the formation of foam, or bubbling liquids do not impair the point-level detection either. We have an appropriate solution for any application. Entrance and Hauser. Okay, so let's take a look on the properties of this sensor. Um, I have some examples here. So uh, here this is the vibronic sensor. So you see the vibrating fork here, the membrane and the piezoelectric stack is inside. So this is a four point level detection in uh, solids and in liquids as well. Um, so this is what you have here, the vibrating fork, the piezoelectric stack, and then the electronics that evaluates this. Uh, some other examples. So this is for solids. So you see long vibrating fork. It can be also on a, on a wire or rope like this, suspended uh, at the bottom of the tank. Uh, so what can you expect? So this measures only point level, so no continuous reading. Uh, it works in applications where you have bubbles and foams. Uh, it works if you want to detect uh, sediments or solids that are under water. So for example, if you have a tank where you clean water, uh, you will have sediments at the bottom and uh, from time to time you may need to drain that. So this sensor may detect the solid underwater. Uh, it works for all liquids that can be pumped. Uh, it is not influenced by turbulence, foam or bubbles. But it's only, as I said, oh, it's only four point level. Um, so at the end, let's take a look on some videos that will compare uh, those principles together. One is quite short.
signal, and the output signal jumps to the overall level. The capacitance probe continues to measure the interface. The new level flex FMP55 multi-parameter switches automatically to the capacitance measuring mode when losing the guided radar signal. Therefore, the FMP55 provides the exact interface and, in addition, the overall level without any signal losses. The sensor fusion principle combines the advantages of two measuring principles in one instrument in an intelligent way. Sensor fusion. Safe, precise, and efficient measurement, also in the presence of emulsion, thanks to Level Flex FMP55 multiparameter. Okay, so uh, by combining the data from a capacitive probe and a guided radar, it's possible to get the interface and the liquid level at the same time. Uh, on the other hand, th the, the sensor is really expensive. We tried to get one for our labs and uh, the, the price was like 250,000 Czech crowns. So like 10,000 euros at least. So we don't have it yet, but maybe we'll have it sometimes in the future. Uh, so let's take a look on the second video. Um, here you will see the, the problems again. Uh, hold on. Yeah, that's the explanation of the determination of interface layers is a frequent measure application of chemical and petrochemical as well as the oil and gas industry. In these applications, capacitance instrumentation as well as the modern measuring principle of guided radar have proven of value. Guided radar technology is based on microwave pulses which are guided along a probe and are partly reflected from the product surface and at the interface. Layer. In clear interface layers, this technology can determine both the overall level and the interface layer. If an emulsion layer frequently forms between both media, this might damp the measured value and even cause a complete loss of the interface signal. This means that the interpretation of the interface signal coincides with the overall level signal. The interface layer is thus not safely detected under emulsion conditions, and an optimum process control cannot considerably smaller than the capacity change of the lower medium, the water. Therefore, the upper medium participates only to a minor extent in the measured overall capacity, which is thus interpreted as an interface. The capacitance measurement provides the advantage that the measuring signal is not affected by the formation of emulsion. However, the capacitance method can only determine the interface. The value for the overall level cannot be derived from a single unit. for interface layer measurement are compared, it becomes apparent that guided radar principles provide reliable values for level and interface if the interface is clear. However, if an emulsion occurs, only the overall level can be measured. The capacitance method, on the contrary, measures the interface layer reliably at any time, but does not provide the overall level. Endress and Hauser combine guided radar and the capacitance technology in a unique multi-parameter sensor. With this innovation, briefly described as sensor fusion, the new Level Flex FMP55 guarantees the simultaneous, redundant, and safe measurement of the overall level and the interface even if emulsion occurs. Level Flex FMP55 multi-parameter, the new interface standard. Available as a coaxial system, a coated rod, or road probe for simultaneous and redundant radar and capacitance measurement. In traditional interface measurement with guided radar, the interface coincides with the overall level signal in case an emulsion is formed. This prevents safe measurements. It is only Level Flex FMP 55 multiparameter which guarantees a redundant measuring system by the combination of guided radar and capacitance technology, thus safeguarding the detection of the interface and the overall level, also in case of emulsions. Sensor fusion. Safe, precise.
precise and efficient measurement, even in the presence of emotions due to level flex FMP 55 multi-parameter. Level measurement of Andrus and Hauser. Okay. So, I think we have some time for the Moodle test. Do you have some questions? Okay, so today it's uh, bonus test 11 done on lecture 12. And it will be called lecture 12. And the session is now started, so you can log in. There are four questions, as always. Some are related for today and some are related to last week. Ready? Okay. Okay, so the ultrasonic flow meter clamp-on system has no pressure loss. Just clamp on the sensor from the outside, so there's no pressure loss caused by the sensor. So the answer here is true. Question two. Okay, a radar liquid level meter uses high frequency signals with 26 gigahertz. The other options, the frequencies are too low, it would not work correctly. So question three. Okay, so the conductivity liquid level meter 
does require a conductive liquid. So uh, you cannot use it for a non-conductive liquid. So we have one more question to go. Okay, so an ultrasonic liquid level meter measures the time to receive the echo. It does not measure the amplitude. The amplitude is not important here. So the answer is false. So that's it. You should see the points now. I wish you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. If you are going home, then enjoy staying home. Uh, some of you will return after Christmas, some will not. And if you're not returning, then I wish you good luck at your home university with your further study. Thank you, and see you next time. Bye.